सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ सोशल साइंस फॉर क्लास एट एंटाइटल्ड आर पास थ्री टेक्स्ट बुक इन हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास एट दिस इज द लेसन फोर ट्राइबल्स डीकूज एंड द विजन of a golden age from page 39 to page 50 let's listen to the lesson 4 page 39 in 1895 a man named birsa was seen roaming the forests and villages of chhota nagpur in jharkhand people said he had miraculous powers he could cure all diseases and multiply grain birsa himself declared that god had appointed him to save his people from trouble free them from the slavery of dikus or outsiders soon thousands began following birsa believing that he was bhagwan or god and had come to solve all their problems birsa was born in a family of mundas a tribal group that lived in chhota nagpur but his followers included other tribals of the region santhals and uraus all of them in different ways were unhappy with the changes they were experiencing and the problems they were facing under british rule their familiar ways of life seemed to be disappearing their livelihoods were under threat and their religion appeared to be in danger what problems did birsa set out to resolve who were the outsiders being referred to as dikus and how did they enslave the people of the region what was happening to the tribal people under the british how did their lives change these are some of the questions you will read about in this chapter you have read about tribal societies last year most tribes had customs and rituals that were very different from those laid down by brahmans these societies also did not have the sharp social divisions that were characteristic of caste societies all those who belonged to the same tribe thought of themselves as sharing common ties of kinship however this did not mean that there were no social and economic differences within tribes figure 1 women of the dongria kandha tribe in orissa wade through the river on the way to the market page 40 how did tribal groups live by the 19th century tribal people in different parts of india were involved in a variety of activities some were jhum cultivators some of them practiced jhum cultivation that is shifting cultivation this was done on small patches of land mostly in forests the cultivators cut the tree tops to allow sunlight to reach the ground and burnt the vegetation on the land to clear it for cultivation they spread the ash from the firing which contained potash to fertilize the soil they used the axe to cut trees and the hoe to scratch the soil in order to prepare it for cultivation they broadcast the seeds that is scattered the seeds on the field instead of plowing the land and sowing the seeds once the crop was ready and harvested they moved to another field a field that had been cultivated once was left fallow for several years shifting cultivators were found in the hilly and forested tracts of 
North East and Central India. The lives of these tribal people depended on free movement within forests and on being able to use the land and forests for growing their crops. That is the only way they could practice shifting cultivation. Some were hunters and gatherers. In many regions, tribal groups lived by hunting animals and gathering forest produce. They saw forests as essential for survival. The Khonds were such a community living in the forests of Orissa. They regularly went out on collective hunts and then divided the meat amongst themselves. They ate fruits and roots collected from the forest and cooked food with the oil they extracted from the seeds of the sal and mahua. They used many forest shrubs and herbs for medicinal purposes and sold forest produce in the local markets. The local weavers and leather workers turned to the khonds when they needed supplies of kusum and palash flowers to colour their clothes and leather. Fallow, a field left uncultivated for a while so that the soil recovers fertility. Sal, a tree. Mahua, a flower that is eaten or used to make alcohol. Figure 2. Dongriya Kandha women in Orissa take home pandanus leaves from the forest to make plates. Page 41. From where did these forest people get their supplies of rice and other grains? At times, they exchanged goods, getting what they needed in return for their valuable forest produce. At other times, they bought goods with the small amount of earnings they had. Some of them did odd jobs in the villages, carrying loads or building roads, while others laboured in the fields of peasants and farmers. When supplies of forest produce shrank, tribal people had to increasingly wander around in search of work as labourers. But many of them, like the Begas of central India, were reluctant to do work for others. The Begas saw themselves as people of the forest who could only live on the produce of the forest. It was below the dignity of a Bega to become a labourer. Tribal groups often needed to buy and sell in order to be able to get the goods that were not produced within the locality. This led to their dependence on traders and money lenders. Traders came around with things for sale and sold the goods at high prices. Money lenders gave loans with which the tribals met their cash needs, adding to what they earned. But the interest charged on the loans was usually very high. So, for the tribals, market and commerce often meant debt and poverty. They, therefore, came to see the moneylender and trader as evil outsiders and the cause of their misery. Some herded animals. Many tribal groups lived by herding and rearing animals. They were pastoralists who moved with their herds of cattle or sheep according to the season. When the grass in one place was exhausted, they moved to another area. The Van Gujars of the Punjab hills and the Labadis of Andhra Pradesh were cattle herders. The Gaddis of Kullu were shepherds and the Bakarwals of Kashmir reared goats. You will read more about them in your history book next year. Figure 3. Location of some tribal groups in India. Here we have a map of India. On this map, following things are marked. 
गद्दीज वन गुजर्स भोतिया सहारिया भिल वन गुजर्स रथवा बंजारा माला इरुलर बैगाज बंजाराज गोंद्स कोया बंजारा गोंद्स बैगाज मरिया गोंद्स संथाल मुंडा उराओ संथाल पराजा बोंडा कंधा कोया साओरा खोंस हजांग खासी खासी रियांग नागा अपातनी निशी जरावाज पेज फोर्टी टू सोर्स वन अ टाइम टू हंट अ टाइम टू सो अ टाइम टू मूव टू अ न्यू फील्ड हैव यू एवर नोटिस्ड दैट पीपल लिविंग इन डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सोसाइटीज टू नॉट शेयर द सेम नोशन ऑफ वर्क एंड टाइम द लाइव्स ऑफ द शिफ्टिंग कल्टिवेटर्स एंड हंटर्स इन डिफरेंट रीजन्स वर रेग्युलेटेड बाय अ कैलेंडर एंड डिविजन ऑफ टास्क फॉर मैन एंड वीमेन वेरियर एलविन a british anthropologist who lived among the bagas and khonds of central india for many years in the 1930s and 1940s gives us a picture of what this calendar and division of tasks was like he writes in chet women went to clearings to cut stalks that were already reaped men cut large trees and go for their ritual hunt the hunt began at full moon from the east traps of bamboo were used for hunting the women gathered fruits like sago tamarind and mushroom bega women can only gather roots or kanda and mahua seeds of all the adivasis in central india the begas were known as the best hunters In Baisak the firing of the forest took place the women gathered unburnt wood to burn men continued to hunt but nearer their villages in jet sowing took place and hunting still went on from ashar to bhado the men worked in the fields in kuar the first fruits of beans were ripened and in kartik kutki became ripe in aghan every crop was ready and in poos winnowing took place poos was also the time for dances and marriages in mag shifts were made to new bewars and hunting gathering was the main subsistence activity the cycle described above took place in the first year in the second year there was more time for hunting as only a few crops had to be sown and harvested but since there was enough food the men lived in the bivars it was only in the third year that the diet had to be supplemented with the forest products adapted from verrier elvin bega 1939 and elvin's unpublished notes on the cones Verrier Elvin Papers, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Figure four: A Santhal girl carrying firewood. Bihar, 1946. Children go with their mothers to the forest to gather forest produce. Activity: Look carefully at the tasks that Bega men and women did. Do you see any pattern? What were the differences in the types of work that they were expected to perform page 43 some took to settled cultivation even before the 19th century many from within the tribal groups had begun settling down and cultivating their fields in one place year after year instead of moving from place to place they began to use the plow and gradually got rights over the land they lived on in many cases like the mundas of chotanagpur the land belonged to the clan as a whole 
all members of the clan were regarded as descendants of the original settlers who had first cleared the land therefore all of them had rights on the land very often some people within the clan acquired more power than others some became chiefs and others followers powerful men often rented out their land instead of cultivating it themselves british officials saw settled tribe groups like the gonds and santhals as more civilized than hunter gatherers or shifting cultivators those who lived in the forests were considered to be wild and savage they needed to be settled and civilized how did colonial rule affect tribal lives the lives of tribal groups changed during british rule let us see what these changes were what happened to tribal chiefs before the arrival of the british in many areas the tribal chiefs were important people they enjoyed a certain amount of economic power and had the right to administer and control their territories in some places they had their own police and decided on the local rules of land and forest management under british rule the functions and powers of the tribal chiefs changed considerably they were allowed to keep their land titles over a cluster of villages and rent out lands but they lost much of their administrative power and were forced to follow laws made by british officials in india they also had to pay tribute to the british and discipline the tribal groups on behalf of the british they lost the authority they had earlier enjoyed amongst their people and were unable to fulfill their traditional functions what happened to the shifting cultivators the british were uncomfortable with groups who moved about and did not have a fixed home what does bevar mean bevar is a term used in madhya pradesh for shifting cultivation figure 5 a log house being built in a village of the nishi tribes of arunachal pradesh the entire village helps when log huts are built page 44 they wanted tribal groups to settle down and become peasant cultivators settled peasants were easier to control and administer than people who were always on the move the british also wanted a regular revenue source for the state so they introduced land settlements that is they measured the land defined the rights of each individual to that land and fixed the revenue demand for the state some peasants were declared land owners others tenants as you have seen in chapter 2 the tenants were to pay rent to the land owner who in turn paid revenue to the state the british effort to settle jhum cultivators was not very successful settled plow cultivation is not easy in areas where water is scarce and the soil is dry in fact jhum cultivators who took to plow cultivation often suffered since their fields did not produce good yields so the jhum cultivators in northeast india insisted on continuing with their traditional practice facing widespread protests the british had to ultimately allow them the right to carry on shifting cultivation in some parts of the forest figure 6 bheel women cultivating in a forest in gujarat shifting cultivation continues in many forest areas of gujarat you can see that trees have been cut and land cleared to create patches for cultivation figure 7 tribal workers in a rice field in andhra pradesh note the difference between rice cultivation in the flat plains and in the forests 
Page 45 Forest Laws and Their Impact The life of tribal groups, as you have seen, was directly connected to the forest. So, changes in forest laws had a considerable effect on tribal lives. The British extended their control all over forests and declared that forests were state property. Some forests were classified as reserved forests for they produced timber which the British wanted. In these forests, people were not allowed to move freely, practice jhum cultivation, collect fruits or hunt animals. How were jhum cultivators to survive in such a situation? Many were therefore forced to move to other areas in search of work and livelihood. But once the British stopped the tribal people from living inside forests, they faced a problem. From where would the forest department get its labour to cut trees for railway sleepers and to transport logs? Colonial officials came up with a solution. They decided that they would give Jhum cultivators small patches of land in the forests and allow them to cultivate these on the condition that those who lived in the villages would have to provide labour to the forest department and look after the forests. So, in many regions, the forest department established forest villages to ensure a regular supply of cheap labour. What does sleeper mean? The horizontal planks of wood on which railway lines are laid. Source 2. In this land of the English, how hard it is to live. In the 1930s, Veria Elvin visited the land of the Begas, a tribal group in central India. He wanted to know about them, their customs and practices, their art and folklore. He recorded many songs that lamented the hard time the Begas were having under British rule. In this land of the English, how hard it is to live! How hard it is to live! In the village sits the landlord, in the gate sits the kotwar, in the garden sits the patwari, in the field sits the government. In this land of the English, how hard it is to live! To pay cattle tax, we have to sell cow. To pay forest tax, we have to sell buffalo. To pay land tax, we have to sell bullock. How are we to get our food in this land of the English? Quoted in Verrier Elvin and Shamrao Hewale, Songs of the Mekal, page 316. Page 46. Many tribal groups reacted against the colonial forest laws. They disobeyed the new rules, continued with practices that were declared illegal and at times rose in open rebellion. Such was the revolt of Songram Sangma in 1906 in Assam and the forest satyagraha of the 1930s in the central provinces. The problem with trade during the 19th century, tribal groups found that traders and money lenders were coming into the forests more often, wanting to buy forest produce, offering cash loans and asking them to work for wages. It took tribal groups some time to understand the consequence of what was happening. Let us consider the case of the silk growers. In the 18th century, Indian silk was in demand in European markets. The fine quality of Indian silk was highly valued and exports from India increased rapidly. As the market expanded, East India Company officials tried to encourage silk production to meet the growing demand. Hazari Bagh in present day Jharkhand was an area where Santhals reared cocoons. The traders dealing in silk sent in their agents who gave loans to the tribal people 
and collected the cocoons. The growers were paid rupees three to rupees four for a thousand cocoons. These were then exported to Burdwan or Gaya, where they were sold at five times the price. The middlemen, so called because they arranged deals between the exporters and silk growers, made huge profits. The silk growers earned very little. Understandably, many tribal groups saw the market and the traders as their main enemies. Figure 8. Godra women weaving. Figure 9. A Hajang woman weaving a mat. For women, domestic work was not confined to the home. They carried their babies with them to the fields and the factories. Page 47. The Search for Work The plight of the tribals who had to go far away from their homes in search of work was even worse. From the late 19th century, tea plantations started coming up and mining became an important industry. Tribals were recruited in large numbers to work the tea plantations of Assam and the coal mines of Jharkhand. They were recruited through contractors who paid them miserably low wages and prevented them from returning home. A Closer Look Through the 19th and 20th centuries, tribal groups in different parts of the country rebelled against the changes in laws, the restrictions on their practices, the new taxes they had to pay and the exploitation by traders and moneylenders. The Coles rebelled in 1831-32. Santhals rose in revolt in 1855. The Bastar Rebellion in central India broke out in 1910 and the Varli Revolt in Maharashtra in 1940. The movement that Birsa led was one such movement. Figure 10 Coal Miners of Bihar, 1948 In the 1920s, about 50% of the miners in the Jharia and Rani Ganj coal mines of Bihar were tribals. Work deep down in the dark and suffocating mines was not only backbreaking and dangerous, it was often literally killing. In the 1920s, over 2,000 workers died every year in the coal mines in India. Activity Find out whether the conditions of work in the mines have changed now. Check how many people die in mines every year and what are the reasons for their death. Page 48 Birsa Munda Birsa was born in the mid-1870s. The son of a poor father, he grew up around the forests of Bohonda, grazing sheep playing the flute and dancing in the local Akhara. Forced by poverty, his father had to move from place to place looking for work. As an adolescent, Birsa heard tales of the Munda uprisings of the past and saw the Sirdars or leaders of the community urging the people to revolt. They talked of a golden age when the Mundas had been free of the oppression of dikus and said there would be a time when the ancestral right of the community would be restored. They saw themselves as the descendants of the original settlers of the region, fighting for their land, or mulk ki ladai, reminding people of the need to win back their kingdom. Birsa went to the local missionary school and listened to the sermons of missionaries. There too, he heard it said that it was possible for the Mundas to attain the kingdom of heaven and regain their lost rights. This would be possible if they became good Christians and gave up their bad practices. Later, Birsa also spent some time in the company of a prominent Vaishnav preacher. He wore the sacred thread 
and began to value the importance of purity and piety. Birsa was deeply influenced by many of the ideas he came in touch with in his growing up years. His movement was aimed at reforming tribal society. He urged the Mundas to give up drinking liquor, clean their village and stop believing in witchcraft and sorcery. But we must remember that Birsa also turned against missionaries and Hindu landlords. He saw them as outside forces that were ruining the Munda way of life. In 1895, Birsa urged his followers to recover their glorious past. He talked of a golden age in the past, a Satyug, the age of truth, when Mundas lived a good life, constructed embankments, tapped natural springs, planted trees and orchids, practiced cultivation to earn their living. They did not kill their brethren and relatives. They lived honestly. Birsa also wanted people to once again work on their land, settle down and cultivate their fields. What worried British officials most was the political aim of the Birsa movement, for it wanted to drive out missionaries' moneylenders, Hindu landlords and the government and set up a Munda Raj with Birsa at its head. The movement identified all these forces as the causes of the misery the Mundas were suffering. Source 3 Blood Trickles From My Shoulders The songs the Mundas sang bemoaned their misery. Alas! Under the drudgery of forced labour, blood trickles from my shoulders. Day and night, the emissary from the zamindars annoys and irritates me. Day and night, I groan. Alas, this is my condition. I do not have a home. Where shall I get happiness? Alas! K.S. Singh, Birsa Munda and His Movement Page 12 Vaishnav, Worshippers of Vishnu Page 49 The land policies of the British were destroying their traditional land system. Hindu landlords and moneylenders were taking over their land and missionaries were criticising their traditional culture. As the movement spread, the British officials decided to act. They arrested Birsa in 1895 convicted him on charges of rioting and jailed him for two years. When Birsa was released in 1897, he began touring the villages to gather support. He used traditional symbols and language to rouse people, urging them to destroy Ravana, which is Dikus and the Europeans, and establish a kingdom under his leadership. Birsa's followers began targeting the symbols of Diku and European power. They attacked police stations and churches and raided the property of moneylenders and zamindars. They raised the white flag as a symbol of Birsa Raj. In 1900, Birsa died of cholera and the movement faded out. However, the movement was significant in at least two ways. First, it forced the colonial government to introduce laws so that the land of the tribals could not be easily taken over by dikus. Secondly, it showed once again that the tribal people had the capacity to protest against injustice and express their anger against colonial rule. They did this in their own specific way, inventing their own rituals and symbols of struggle. Elsewhere Why do we need cash? There are many reasons why tribal and other social groups often do not wish to produce for the market. This tribal song from Papua New Guinea gives us a glimpse of how the tribals there viewed the market. 
We say cash is unsatisfactory trash. It won't keep off rain and it gives me pain. So why should I work my guts from coconut trees for these government muts? Cash cropping is all very well if you've got something to sell. But tell me sir why if there's nothing to buy should I bother? Adapted from a song quoted in Cohn, Clark and Haswell, Ed's The Economy of Substenance Agriculture, 1970. Let's recall. 1. Fill in the blanks. A. The British described the tribal people as Dash. B. The method of sowing seeds in chum cultivation is known as Dash. C. The tribal chiefs got Dash titles in central India under the British land settlements. D. Tribals went to work in the Dash of Assam and the Dash in Bihar. Page 50. 2. State whether true or false. A. Jhum cultivators plough the land and sow seeds. B. Cocoons were bought from the Santhals and sold by the traders at five times the purchase price. C. Birsa urged his followers to purify themselves, give up drinking liquor and stop believing in witchcraft and sorcery. D. The British wanted to preserve the tribal way of life. Let's discuss. 3. What problems did shifting cultivators face under British rule? 4. How did the powers of tribal chiefs change under colonial rule? 5. What accounts for the anger of the tribals against the Dikus? 6. What was Birsa's vision of a golden age? Why do you think such a vision appealed to the people of the region? Let's do. 7. Find out from your parents, friends or teachers the names of some heroes of other tribal revolts in the 20th century. Write their story in your own words. 8. Choose any tribal group living in India today. Find out about their customs and way of life and how their lives have changed in the last 50 years. Let's imagine. Imagine you are a Jhum cultivator living in a forest village in the 19th century. You have been told that the land you were born on no longer belongs to you. In a meeting with British officials, you try to explain the kinds of problems you face. What would you say? The chapter 4 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator Akash Ahuja Technical Coordinator Buddy Lang Lingdo Production Assistant Meenakshi Kukreti Producer Vandana Arimardan Presented by CIET NCERT New Delhi, India